Okay, well, welcome everybody, and happy holidays. Uh, this is um, uh, Bristol Better You, and our topic for today is going to be how New York City invented the holiday season. And I am your speaker, Ron Brown. Even though you won't be able to see me, you are here, and we will take questions, and everything will go as planned. So, why don't we get started? Well, how New York invented the holiday season. I'll bet a lot of you didn't know that New York invented the holiday season, but so many of the events, the personalities, the actions, the celebrations that we associate with the holiday season were born here in New York, and uh, for very interesting historic reasons. Well, of course, the origin of the holiday season begins with the very Christian Christmas season. Well, from the earliest centuries, um, the Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox Church, as well as the Roman Catholic Church out of Rome and Italy, and the Egyptian and Ethiopian Copts, realized that there was a need to celebrate a major event in Christian history, which was to be the birth of Jesus. And so, they all three of these ancient churches started celebrating Christmas, and since they were all part of the Roman Empire, they settled in on the Roman holiday of Saturnalia, which was in the middle of December. And they assigned the birth of Jesus to that particular day. Now, of course, as you probably know, in the Bible, there is no specific reference to when Jesus was born. I we lived in Israel for five years and spent many wonderful Christmases there. And I know that no self-respecting shepherd nor his sheep would be out in the fields in the middle of December. So probably the actual birth date would be in the spring. But since the Romans were busy celebrating their holiday of Saturnalia with gift-giving and parties, the Christians decided that that would be a good time to to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So there was no biblical um, origin for, or justification for December 25th. Well, this became a problem when into the story stepped Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer. And his idea was take Chris, Christianity back to its pure forms. And he rejected bishops, priests and nuns, um, nuns in convents, monks, celibacy for priests. He said, it's not in the Bible, get rid of it. He rejected the Pope. He translated the Bible into German. Why read it in some foreign language? He reduced the number of sacraments from seven to three and then to two. He got rid of statues, he even wanted to get rid of organs and hymn singing. The Eucharist, rather than every day like the Catholics and the Greek Orthodox and the Copts were doing, he reduced it to a couple times a year or at most on Sunday. Got rid of anything associated with Mary. But Christmas proved to be a stumbling block. Because as much as he realized there was no biblical justification for this big December 25th holiday, he realized that people, and especially the Germans, were already deeply attached to the holiday. So they decided to keep it. Well, other Christian reformers, such as um, John Calvin and Huss and Zwingli and the other people, really had a major problem with the holiday. So basically, by the end of the Reformation, we had two big groups in Europe battling over whether Christmas was an authentic Christmas holiday. You had the anti-Christmas militants. These were our Puritan ancestors in England who eventually settled in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Maine. The Presbyterians up in Scotland were vicious anti-Christmas people. The Baptists threw it in the garbage. The Methodists said absolutely no way, and the Quakers got rid of it as well. So you had a very powerful anti-Christmas movement within the Protestant Reformation. Pro-Christmas people, well, they were the Catholics who loved Christmas. The Anglicans in England, the Episcopal Church in America, 
celebrated Christmas. The Lutherans had it. The Moravians just loved Christmas. So within Protestantism, you had a major split down the middle between the anti-Christmas and the pro-Christmas factions. Well, this holy war, or Christmas war, made its way to the United States, the 13 colonies. Under the Dutch, they were lukewarm about Christmas. But in the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam, there were already Lutherans who were busily celebrating Christmas. The Methodists and the Baptists did absolutely nothing on Christmas. The Quakers out in Flushing shunned Christmas as a pagan holiday. But in 1664, the English took over, and the Christmas became a major city holiday. Then, of course, you had the American Revolution and the um, opening of new immigrant groups coming in. The Irish, of course, loved Christmas, as did the Germans. The Scots came and shunned Christmas. The Baptists and the Methodists, which became the two largest churches in New York and in the 13 colonies, were vicious anti-Christmas uh, groups. Now, if anybody reads um, Henry James Washington Square, we see in that story how important this great debate over Christmas was in early um, New York history. Well, there were a lot of other divisions in American society, the North and the South, slavery, anti-slavery, what kind of government we were going to have, uniting the 13 colonies into a new independent country. So gradually, Americans felt the need for national holidays as an instrument for uniting all Americans, whether they were Christmas or anti-Christmas people, whether they were Catholics or Protestants, or eventually even Jews. So there was a need for a national holiday to unite the people. And so gradually, as we're going to see today, the holiday of Christmas became increasingly a secular holiday. And here we see in the two pictures the religious holiday of Christmas, and we see what it eventually became, a totally secular holiday where you send happy holiday cards. Now, one of the founding fathers of this new emerging holiday season was, a name I'm sure you'll recognize, Clement Clark Moore. He was the person who kidnapped St. Nicholas and drug him, kicking and screaming, from his status as a bishop to his status as a secular holiday celebrating person. In fact, it is Simon Clark Moore who we can say invented the Christmas season here in New York. Now, he was a professor of theology at the Episcopal um, Divinity School here in um, the middle of Manhattan. His most famous book was The Night Before Christmas or A Visit from St. Nicholas. Now, why would you think this would be of such major importance? Well, the Dutch, who loved the holiday of St. Of Nicholas, <clears throat> in fact, St. Nicholas played a very important part in the founding of New York. This picture on the left, we see a drawing of early Dutch New Amsterdam. And in the middle, we see the pointed church, that is the church of St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas was the patron saint of Holland. Well, of course, the holiday of St. Nicholas, the feast day of St. Nicholas, is December 6th. And so the Dutch, while they were questionable about whether they should celebrate this holiday season of Christmas, since it was not in the Bible and it was a rather pagan holiday, they compromised. They had a modest celebration of Christmas with maybe going to church and a dinner, but that was about it. But on the holiday of St. Nicholas, good old St. Nicholas, a, Dutch, a bishop from Turkey, Greek Orthodox bishop, 
That is when the Dutch gave presents to their children. So when Clement Clark Moore moved St. Nicholas from December 6th to December 25th, this was the beginning of the American Christmas, where gift giving was associated no longer with December 6th, but December 25th. And so this happened here in New York. Another great New Yorker who had a very important role in evolving the American holiday season was Washington Irving, one of the first great historians of New York. And he wrote in 1820 his wonderful book, The Keeping of Christmas at Bracebridge Hall. And in his sketchbook of 1856, he described old Christmas. And he argued that the Dutch loved Christmas and gift giving, and that this was an authentic American holiday deeply rooted in our history which any historian knows is complete bunk, because the Dutch barely celebrated Christmas. They celebrated St. Nicholas Day. But Washington Irving blended all of these together in what he called an authentic American holiday. Totally fictitious, but that's how you invent holidays. Well, into the story drove another New Yorker, a German immigrant named Thomas Nast. You'll probably recognize the name because he's the one who invented the elephant for the Republican Party and the donkey for those wonderful Democrats. Well, he was a designer for newspapers. He was the person who took Santa Claus and gave him a very important political role. If you look at the slide on the right, you see Harper's Weekly, a New York illustrated magazine of the Civil War period. And here we see Thomas Nast's depiction of a Santa figure wearing a red coat with stars, giving presents to the soldiers during the Civil War. Because Thomas Nast argued that what Americans needed to overcome the trauma of the Civil War and to unite all of the states, both slave and free, to heal the wounds of the Civil War, Americans needed a holiday that they could all join together and celebrate. And so he shows here American flag soldiers lining up to get gifts from the Santa Claus figure. Now, of course, um, because of Washington Irving and Clement Clark Moore, old St. Nicholas was no longer a bishop. So it was uh, Watton Thomas Nast who transferred him to the North Pole. I'm sure he didn't agree with that, but you can imagine leaving the balmy shores of the Mediterranean, where the city of Mira is, and dragging that poor St. Nicholas to the North Pole, where it was frigid. He had to give him a warm suit of clothes, so he's no longer a bishop, but he was a fat man with a red woolen jacket. Well, for a number of years during the Civil War, he experimented and tried to come up with a costume that would be the, the image that we recognize of Santa Claus. And here we see one of his first attempts on the left. We see he's up in the North Pole. We see him with a red hat and a red jacket and pants, a white beard, very fat, with a dog. And so gradually Thomas Nast did a complete makeover of St. Nicholas and turned him into the figure which we all represent, which we all recognize as good old Santa Claus St. Nicholas. Well, another major event that happened in New York in creating this new holiday was Thomas Edison, the father of the um, telegraph and so many other electrical inventions. But we tend to forget that he is the very first person to come up with the idea of a string of electric lights that you could wrap around your Christmas tree. 
So for the first time it was possible, and even more importantly, it was safe, to bring the old German Christmas tree indoors. Now, of course, if you have a string of Christmas lights, you're going to have to have a source of electricity. So he built the very first commercial electric generating plant in Manhattan, and the wealthy people could run a line from this plant to their Fifth Avenue mansions or to their department store, and Christmas became electrified. And if you look at the picture on the right, we see the Edison electric lighting outfit sold by John Wanamaker. And if you look closely at the gentleman, I mean, he's wearing more clothes to decorate his Christmas tree than I wear when I go to the opera, which shows that it is clearly an upper class holiday because only the wealthy could afford to link up to his power station, bring electricity into the house. But already Christmas was becoming electrified. It was moving indoors. It was becoming a family gathering of upper middle class people. Well, the next step in the growth of our secular holiday season from its Christian origins occurred in 1907 when the brand new New York Times building opened up at that wonderful corner between 42nd Street and uh, uh, Broadway. And to celebrate his new building, the New York Times Company decided to begin a new tradition of dropping a ball from the top of the building, counting off the seconds until the ball touched 42nd Street, marking the beginning of the new year. So we no longer had Christmas, which had absorbed the feast of uh, St. Nicholas, but we had the week following it as part of this growing holiday season, a tradition which exists until today. Now, of course, another step that we will recognize immediately, I'm sure a lot of you remember the old Woolworth stores with their big red band around them, good quality merchandise at a very good price. Well, F.W. Woolworth was a businessman, and of course, like any businessman, his goal is to make money. Well, in 1878, he founded the first F.W. Woolworth store. Well, to attract customers to his store, he went to Germany and he signed a monopoly agreement with the German makers of these wonderful glass Christmas tree decorations. The Germans really monopolized that market. He signed an exclusive agreement that he would be the only one allowed to market these Christmas decorations in the United States. Of course, the small ones were sold for five cents. The larger ones were sold for ten cents. And that is the origin of the five and dime store, or the five and ten cent store. And Christmas went nationwide. Woolworth published books on Christmas, gave uh, Christmas tree decorations, store window decorations, Santa Clauses. And it was really because of Woolworth that Christmas started leaving New York and becoming a national holiday. And on the right, we see one of the very first pictures, a painting actually, of the Woolworth building, which he built as the headquarters for his company, which still stands uh, right across from City Hall on Broadway. Now, this uh, company today still exists. You know, I'll probably bet you wonder whatever happened to Woolworth Company, all those stores where we used to go to. Well, it still exists. He broke his stores up, or his descendants did, into Gap and Gap Kids and Foot Locker. And rather than one big store selling everything, it became more boutique stores. So the company is still alive and well and still headquartered in the F.W. Woolworth building. Well, if New Year's became sort of a bookend 
on one side for this growing holiday season. The other book end, the other end, be, was the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, which I'm sure you just watched a couple a week ago on television. Well, Mr. Macy, who established Macy's Department Store, really wasn't so concerned about Christmas or Thanksgiving or turkeys. He was more or less like any businessman, interested in making money. So what he did when he organized his first Macy's Day Parade in 1924 was the last float in the parade was Santa Claus. So for the whole parade, you're celebrating Thanksgiving. But when that last float goes by and there's Santa Claus and his reindeer ushering in the holiday Christmas shopping season. Now, the year 1924 is important. Remember, that is the Roaring Twenties. That was a time when New York and the United States was a flush with money, where everybody was going out and shopping. So basically, that tactic extended the Christmas season to and gave it an official beginning. And so now we have Grey Thursday, which is still rather controversial, but barely has Santa Claus passed in front of you, then the stores start opening, and everybody dashes in for the sales. Black Friday, which is, uh, somebody once asked me why do we call it Black Friday, but when a business is in the black, that means it is making a profit. When it is losing money, we say that a business is in red. So here again the color symbolism was important. A lot of stores in New York and even nationwide make up to 30 percent of their annual profit in that one day, Black Friday. It is the biggest selling day of the year and as we just saw Saturday morning everybody is watching the news how was Black Friday this year sort of as, as if it is a sign from God about the financial status of the country. Well, this year, Black Friday was not very successful. They lost about 10%, but they more than made up for it on another wonderful invention called Cyber Monday. Now, of course, if you may have a lot of savings on Grey Thursday, Black Friday, and Cyber Monday, well, then along comes Giving Tuesday, and you are expected to contribute some money to the charity of your choice. So we see the shift from the holiday season becoming more and more commercial all the time. Well, another wonderful New York institution which marked the holiday season was in 1931, Shifting from Macy's Parade at the height of the Roaring Twenties to the Depression years of the Thirties. Well, John D. Rockefeller was building his famous Rockefeller Center as a, as a sign of defiance, saying, yes, we are in the f middle of a Great Depression, but the future is going to be even more glorious. So it was, and it still is a tradition, that when you top off a building, you're building a big skyscraper, when the steel girders reach their top floor, the workers take a holiday. They put up a tree, they decorate the tree, and they celebrate the topping off of the building. Well, it just so happened that the topping off of the central tower at Rockefeller Center was around Christmas in early December. So they put up a tree, this one not at the top of the building where nobody would be able to see it because it was so tall, but down in front of the building. They decorated it. They, uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr., even though he was a strict Baptist, brought in cakes of beer and food and they celebrated the first Rockefeller Christmas tree, which is until today not only an American institution, but it has become a global institution. The lighting of the Rockefeller Christmas tree, like the uh, Thanksgiving Day Parade, is a major part of the holiday. 
Well, another holiday which started making its way into the holiday season was, of course, Hanukkah, which became part of the a Jewish contribution to the growing holiday season. On the right, we see the lighting of the largest menorah in the world uh, by the um, Lubavitcher um, uh, Rebbe, and it is part of the holiday season. Now, Irving Berlin uh, was a major figure in the growth of the holiday season, and he contributed White Christmas and so many other of our famous Christmas songs. He himself was Jewish, which is another Jewish contribution to the holiday season. Now, the holiday of Hanukkah, or the Festival of Lights, even the title, Festival of Lights, sort of sounds almost Christmassy, even though it is a Jewish holiday. It is an eight-day Jewish holiday commemorating the dedication of the so-called Second Temple, um, in Jerusalem. And the holiday was celebrated because the oil for, uh, which was enough for one day, ended up lasting eight. And so it was considered a miracle. Now, of course, Hanukkah is not considered a major Jewish holiday. In fact, it's um, considered a very minor holiday, uh, and it is derived from the dedication of the Second Temple account, which is in the first and second book of Maccabees, which is marginally considered canonical, uh, canonical as being part of the Bible. It's not recognized by, as by part of the Bible by Protestants and Jews, but it is accepted as part of the Orthodox, Catholic, and Coptic churches. So it has always been a minor holiday um, uh, for Jews, not like Yom Kippur or Passover, which are biblical holidays. But because of its association during the growing holiday season, all kinds of traditions became associated with the um, with the holiday, and it began growing in importance. Here on the left, you see just a variety of the wonderful uh, candelabras called the Hanukkiahs, uh, which became objects of art in their own right. And on the right, we see a Chagall um, uh, window with the um, with his version of the Hanukkiah. Of course, associated with the holiday was the dreidel, which is the little top which you see on the, on the bottom left-hand corner, with the four letters N-G-H-S, which in Hebrew means Neskadol Hayasham, or it means a great miracle happened there. You turn it and um, one of the letters shows up. It's interesting, in Israel, they, since uh, Hanukkah emerged as a holiday uh, in foreign countries, when Israelis celebrate um, Hanukkah in Israel itself, they say Neskadol Hayapu, which means a great miracle happened here. So here we see the division between Jews in the diaspora and Jews living in Israel. Hanukkah also had the tradition of giving Geld, which is the Yiddish and German word for money, to children, which gradually grew from giving Geld or money to part of the great holiday shopping frenzy. Latkas uh, joined uh, Christmas cookies and <clears throat> other holiday foods for, uh, as part of the holiday season. And, of course, the lighting of the Central Park menorah, the largest menorah um, in the uh, world. Uh, and we see the candlestick in Central Park. And that was begun by the Lubavitcher Grand Rebbe in 1974, the, great, the late um, Menachem um, Schneerson. Now, African Americans also contributed their part to the growing holiday season. 
Here we see a picture of the old Bloomstein department store on 125th Street in the middle of Harlem. It was probably one of the last bastions of Jewish Harlem before the African Americans started taking over the neighborhood and transformed Harlem from an upper class white and Jewish neighborhood into a predominantly African American neighborhood, which began during the years of World War I. Well, Mr. Bloomstein wasn't thrilled with the loss of his Jewish Harlem uh, to African Americans. So, of course, African Americans were allowed to shop there, but he would not hire them to work in his store. So, in 1929, Reverend Adam Clayton Powell, Jr., started a boycott of the Bloomstein department store. The slogan was, don't shop where you cannot work. Well, as Christmas approached, Mr. Bloomstein realized he was going to lose money on his largest shopping days of the year. So finally he relented and he started hiring African American women at the cash register in positions of importance and he realized it was good for business. So he decided to have the first African American Santa Claus in the country and that happened here in Bloomstein. He also had black mannequins in the windows modeling clothing. And so that all began here in Harlem, the first black Santa Claus. Well, a number of years later, Ron Karenga in 1966 decided to add a very strong African-American component to this growing holiday season and that became the holiday of Kwanzaa which is celebrated from the day after Christmas to New Year's Day. A week of celebrations of lighting candles, um, each candle having a meaning how-to books, um, and how to celebrate it, and it became an African-American component of this holiday season. Now, of course, Ron Karenga had very strong black nationalist roots, which is a very interesting chapter. He wanted African-Americans to stop celebrating this white Christmas holiday and to celebrate his new African-American holiday. But the power of the holiday season simply co-opted the holiday, and Kwanzaa became just one of the many holidays that was being incorporated into this new holiday season. And so we see the, the Kenta cloth, we see African-American women wearing African costumes, and celebrating this new holiday. So it was no longer an oppositional alternative to Christmas as Karenga and Marcus Garvey had planned, but it became a, incorporated into the holiday. So it was a sign of black power and of black presence inside this new uh, growing holiday season. And of course, there is a very strong African-American pride, black pride component to the holiday season. And we see the libation statement where they drink a glass of wine, or not wine, but of juice, or mainly fruit juice, and they read their statements uh, for the motherland, Africa, the cradle of civilization, for our ancestors, our elders, for the youth, um, for the struggle and remembrance of those who have struggled on our behalf, the principle of unity, and it even has a religious component for the creator who provides all things. Once again, a holiday to include all African Americans, Catholic, Protestant, atheists, Muslims, or whatever. The Seven Principles of African Heritage. Interestingly, these names are taken from Swahili. The, 
no slaves were brought from the um, Indian Ocean coast, uh, the east coast of Africa. They were all brought from Congo and the um, Atlantic coast. But Swahili had become one of the most widely spread new languages of Africa. And so Rankarenga adopted these words um, and the uh, seven principles of unity, collective work, cooperative economics, purpose, creativity, and faith uh, as being the seven principles of this new holiday of Kwanzaa. Now, if you look closely at the holiday of Kwanzaa, even the lighting of the candles, we see this sort of um, advent wreath. We see the lighting of the menorah candles. Once again, even though the holidays of, uh, of Hanukkah and Christmas and Kwanzaa are very different, they do have a lot of common uh, links. They're celebrated uh, religiously. Um, they have gift giving, very children oriented the lighting of candles. It is not a one-day holiday. It is an extended holiday period. And so we see the lighting of one candle each day and very Africa-oriented. Now, the holiday of, or the holiday season is a continuously growing season. We not only have so many things, which are Christmas cookies, we have eggnog. Um, I gave this talk a couple days ago, and a Scottish person got up and started yelling at me because I didn't have Boxing Day included, which is when in England the Lord of the Manor, after his festive Christmas party of, Chris, of December 24th and overnight, on the day after Christmas, he would take up all the leftover food, wrap it up nicely in boxes with a bottle of wine or beer, and all of the staff would have their Christmas party the day after Christmas. So Boxing Day was a day of giving boxed gifts to people. It had nothing to do with the sport of boxing. Well, another holiday, which is gradually making its way into the holiday season, is the Hindu holiday of Diwali. Once again, a festival of lights. Now, you might wonder, why are lights and candles and Christmas decorations and menorahs and Kwanzaa candles, why are they so important for this holiday season? Well, the winter solstice, which is also part of this holiday season, marks the shortest day of the year, where the sunlight is the weakest, the night is the longest. So this is a natural time to celebrate the sun, to celebrate light. And so the Hindus, of course, in their midwinter holiday, which varies from year to year, but it is gradually being associated with this growing holiday season. Uh, just a couple days ago, I did a walking tour of the Jackson Heights neighborhood in Queens. And there's a street there where it, it's filled with Indian Hindu shops. I always take my students there to show them 24 karat gold in the windows, which you don't often see. And the streets were completely filled with lights like the one in the picture on the right. And the students said, oh, they're celebrating Christmas. And I said, no, these are the lights from the holiday of Diwali, which they leave up to correspond with the Christmas holiday. So as Christmas, the holiday season, goes global, it gradually is absorbing more and more national holidays. And uh, and today you see Santa Claus, the dropping of the uh, New Year's ball, filming of the lighting of the Rockefeller tree. These are becoming not only New York, and thanks to Woolworth, American, but they are gradually becoming more and more global holidays uh, where they will absorb more and more holidays from other countries. So I think we are now ready to move on to questions and hopefully I will be able to give you answers. So 
You can't see me, but sort of imagine a Santa Claus figure sitting here in his red suit. And I will take any questions that you have to um, throw at me. Pardon? Yeah. Woodcliffe Lake out there in New Jersey. Do you have any questions for me? No. No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Happy holidays. Andrea, uh, do you have any questions for us? Andrea, are you there? Westbury, do you have any questions for me? Okay, having some problems. Westbury, are you there? Uh, East Northport, do you have a question for me? Yes, we do. Hold on just a moment. Okay. Hello. Hello. What about this movement to stop using the uh, term Merry Christmas and say Happy Holidays? Well, that is a um, very strong movement, and there is a very strong counter movement. Um, even though Christmas uh, has been has started becoming the holiday season, there are still a lot of people who believe that it does have a religious component, and so offices might have a holiday party, but you hear this mixture of Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, uh, and other Happy Kwanzaa, which is part of it. So it would be very interesting to see how this will go. There is a big reaction against this sort of generic holiday season happening in foreign countries where um, in India now they are trying to outlaw Christmas as the Hindu religious party uh, is taking power and they are want to Hinduize the country. Certain countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran and Israel have major clampdowns on holidays. In fact, last year they had a big raid at a big hotel in Tel Aviv which was celebrating New Year's because the government said New Year's is not a Jewish holiday and the hotel lost its kosher license. And a lot of fundamentalist Christians in the United States are, their slogan is put Christ back in Christmas. There have been a whole string of Supreme Court decisions on whether the Christmas tree is a religious or a secular um, symbol, and whether having a Christmas tree beside a um, menorah uh, uh, is adequate or if they are adequate secular symbols, because the menorah is clearly not a secular symbol. So there is a major crisis growing in, uh, in regards to the secularization of Christmas, even the, um, the commercial aspect of Christmas. A lot of people say that it has lost its religious component. And so it is in a period of major crisis, whether it will um, continue to be a holiday season or whether it will break down and it will return to its diverse religious uh, roots. So it is, um, it is in a major state of crisis. It is a major critical thing. But I would say having lived in half a dozen countries of the world and celebrated <clears throat> holidays in foreign countries that Things like the Christmas tree, like Santa Claus, the New Year's. I mean, you have to realize that most of the world still does not accept the uh, year 2014. This is a typically Christian invention. You have the Hebrew calendar, you have the Muslim calendar, the Buddhist calendar. So these questions are really um, emerging as major issues 
even at the same time as the holiday season is going global. So it is, yes, there's a lot of controversy still involved in the holiday season. Seville, do you have any questions for me? Do you have any questions for me? Okay. Yeah. Could you repeat the question? Seville, um, we're having difficulty hearing you. East Meadow, do you have a question for me? Yes, we would like to know what is your favorite holiday? <laughs> From among the holiday season? Yes. Well, we, enjoy, we enjoyed your presentation very much, but we are wondering what's your personal favorite? Well, I must say, I have seven brothers and sisters, and I have 35 nieces and nephews and over 150 cousins. Uh, in the close family. And so Christmas has always been very important for me because I, I was raised Roman Catholic. I was an altar boy. I remember getting up for midnight mass. And so I must say that um, the secularization hasn't quite hit me because I'm still very much of a Christmas person. But I found that living in foreign countries, I mean, I lived in Israel for, for five years, and when you live in a foreign country, uh, I mean, Christmas was part of it, but you get very much involved in Hanukkah, and it is the Hanukkah parties and going to visit friends for, uh, for Hanukkah. So I get into most any holiday. My main criteria for having a good holiday is how much free food and drink is going to be available. So that's sort of my, um, my basic position. Okay, uh, Lindbrook, do you have a question for me? No questions, thank you. Okay, thank you. North Woodmere, do you have a question for me? Could you repeat the question again? What's the significance? significance of all blue lights on a Christmas tree? Is it a Jewish family trying to fit in? Is it a Jewish family trying to fit in? That is an excellent question. I have never seen all blue lights on a Christmas tree. Where, where did you see this? In Oceanside. In Oceanside. What, was, it a, was it a Jewish family or something? I really don't know. I, I, I was trying to knock on the door and find out. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you should knock on the door because if they have a, 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 a tree up and it has blue lights and it is visible from the street, I would say, and it is the holiday season, you might get a free glass of eggnog or, or some other... Um, um, issue. And I'll tell you, if you do find out, I would love to uh, know. So if you could just um, contact it here um, uh, uh, at uh, Hofstra, uh, Debbie would uh, forward the information from uh, to me. That would be a fascinating topic. Now, I have seen trees where they do specialize in a particular color as a um, as just as a color scheme. So it might not have had any um, significance to it, but then again, it might. So I would just suggest, knock on the door, go in, and say that you're curious, and ask if it has any meaning. I'm sure they won't throw you out. Okay, North Hill. No, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and happy holidays. <laughs>